Welcome again to another episode of The Conversation. I'm delighted to be joined again by Alexis Nunes, but today we welcome Luther Blissett, who should need no introduction, but I'll go ahead and offer a short one, given how much he means to me. And um, I feel the role that he played in allowing me to, to be a professional footballer. Luther's probably best known for his time at Watford, also spent time at AC Milan and Syria. Uh, Sydney is, is an ambassador for the game, um, has been there, seen it, and done it. Luther, thanks for taking time to join us today. Okay, it's my pleasure, man. My absolute pleasure to come along and have this conversation with you guys. I'm looking forward to it. And, and I, I know Alexis is, is, is also pleased. Alexis, being from, from Jamaica herself, to, to have you being Jamaica born. <laughs> Uh, and representing <laughs> representing football in the way that you did, I, I know brings a, a special smile to her face as well. And and now I feel outnumbered. I feel a little bit outnumbered. As I'm, you I, should. I'm not lie. As <laughs> you should. <laughs> Jamaicans outshining Trini as per usual. <laughs> <laughs> Luke, uh, th thanks again for for joining us. As as I mentioned to you beforehand, and and wanting to do this interview, Alexis and I have had a series of these conversations, as, as we're calling them, around racism in sport, yeah. how it exists within the game and the role that the game can play in terms of um, addressing what is ultimately a societal issue. Yeah. And while there's been a lot of focus on what's been happening over the course of the last 18 months, I think it's important to, to give this moment context. And I don't think there are many people better in the game to give a broader, broader, more uh, historical context to race and sport, given the role that you played um, in, in those early days through the 80s and, and, and 90s when you played. Tell us a little bit about some of the racism that maybe you endured during your time at the peak of your career. Well, let me start really from when I arrived in England, my mother, my mother and father came over about a year before myself and my older sister and brother flew over. And we arrived in England and it was obviously very, 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 very different because when we arrived, it was snowing, which was very strange. Funny <laughs> beach and whatever, and here you are. But, you know, we arrived here and then you go out shopping with your mother like you would do when you're back in, in Jamaica or wherever, you know, you go down the market where you go shopping. And you walk in, walking along at mum, and you know there are signs in certain windows which say, you know, no, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish, those sort of things. I'm thinking, what does that mean? And I remember my mother saying to me, things are a bit different here because people have different attitudes towards people of colour, say, and you know you do get called names and other things. Uh, mother, I remember she told me they actually had um, an act in the in a lot of the, um, the show racism films that we did at school, mm -hmm. we actually were spoken about. And yes, my mother and father and myself were subjected to that when we arrived in the country. You know, sometimes you knock on the door and people would empty their chamber out of the window and you could go away and shout up abuse at you. So from a very young age, I was aware that things weren't quite like it was back in the Caribbean. And you know, you'd come somewhere where was slightly different, there was a slightly different attitude towards people and the way they treated you. And you had this when you went to the shop and that's the first time I heard anybody use the N word, say, in the shop, you know, they said, you know, what are those doing in here? You know? And my mother said, no, don't worry, we'll go and we'll go and shop somewhere else. Um, and then she would just talk about it with me afterwards. It's something we have, we have to learn to deal with until people get to know you, then they are a little bit more comfortable but when they don't know you you're very different and it can be a problem for some people so that was my introductory to that at the age of about six or seven you get that all the way to come through school because at the time when you had the skinheads roaming the streets you know dressed wanting to kick any kick anybody's heads in you know and that's when you know the word you know looking for for people from Pakistan you know the Paki bashing and all that came out and if you're of color you were at risk if these certain people saw you. 
So you became very streetwise, let's say, of knowing where to, where to go and where you couldn't go. And when you did, you made sure you were in company whenever you were going to certain places. So I had an early introductory and education on that. And that helped me no end when I started playing football. Because you start playing football and you are now going to different places all over the country, places that as a kid when you're growing up, you've never been those places before. And you are entering into a arena where it's people's passions are always here because their team, they support them, they come from there and they can identify with a lot of the players on the pitch because they're probably all local at that time, which most of them were, unlike we get these days. So you're almost that um, outsider going in anywhere. And so for me, it was a case of how do you deal with that every week when you're walking out to play football? Um, you know, with three, four, five, ten thousand people just shouting abuse just because of your skin colour. And uh, it does, even with what had gone before, when it was just pointed just at you, because you were the only black face there, it was very personal and it was very much it's almost like you're in a normal stadium and nobody else was there but you and all the lights were shining on you everywhere you went. So it was very, it was, it was tough in that respect. But having good people around you helped me know, and then they would say, look, take no difference. And one of the things I got from people around me, players and whatever, was, you know, the best way to make these people really hurt? See that thing with the net hanging on it? You put the ball in there, and that hurts them sometimes far more than anything else, rather than if you react and whatever. Because I've seen other players react, that players have reacted and it didn't work out too well for them. So again, lessons learned from what goes on around. Um, I can just keep talking. So let, let's stop there for a moment if there's anything you want to <laughs> with me continue. And um, Luther, you know, I, I suppose just interesting hearing you, you know, say all that, it literally makes my skin crawl, even just mm. thinking that you had to encounter those signs um, growing up. But just hearing you speak as well um, about it, it definitely echoes of what a lot of our guests have had on, whether they've been young, you know, your age or whatnot. So I know Shaq, of course, had to go through it as well um, as a footballer. But, you know, when we look at footballers, at least me as a obviously non-professional footballer, you know, we look at you guys as, as superstars. And I think that, you know, fan bases and what you had to go through, it's almost like polar opposites. Um, I keep bringing, you know, this lineup because we got to speak with U.S. men's national player, Weston McKinney, and at so young, he said now with his experience as well playing in Italy, you know, five days a week, he's just a regular black kid. But on the weekends, it's like he's a superstar and all these people that would probably normally racially insult him Monday to Friday on Saturday and Sunday, they're like, oh, he's one of our own, you know. How did you, I suppose, deal with that when you started professionally? Because as you said, you probably encountered people that if they saw you uh, Monday to Friday, they would say something racially aggressive towards you. And then on Saturday and Sunday, they're like, oh, Luther Blissett, he's one of our own. You know, did you feel like with when you became a footballer, it gave you like an extra layer of armor to tackle this? I think, I don't know if it was, a, it was an extra layer of armor, what I felt, it gave me an opportunity, becoming a professional footballer, to set an example for the people that were abusing you and also for anybody else of colour that wanted to come and do what I wanted to do. And you, had, you had two ways. You would react and, you know, that face up the people, you know, your teeth wide, your teeth bared and eyes open, that sort of thing. Or you would just take a step back and say, fine. That's what you think. I'm not going to get involved in. I'm here to do this. And that was my attitude, having seen what had gone on with players previously. What had gone on. You've got to find a way of navigating that minefield that you're in. Mm. And for me, it was a case of, I'm not going to be the aggressor, but I'm also not just going to just lay down and, and let people walk all over you. So... The place I could deal with it in a very strong and firm way first was on that green piece of turf. When I crossed that line, anybody that used racist or that sort of use of language to me, I really wouldn't be arguing with them. I would deal with them in quite a physical way. Mm -hmm. Because if there was an opportunity where you could hit them late and go over the top, I'll do it. Because it was a case of, of that you play football or this is how it's going to be. And I tell you what, I'm not going to be the one that gets carried off. It's going to be you. Yeah. 
without literally having to do that. And you just have to find a way of letting people know that you're here to play football. And if you want to, that's all I want to do. Then afterwards, you know, if you want to argue with me afterwards, I'll argue indoors, in private, whatever, if that be the case. But when I'm working, I'm working. And I don't expect that sort of nonsense around. So that was something I, again, from being very young when it first started, when I came to England, you have to find a way, as I said, to navigate it. And I found, get on with what you do. Be focused on where you're going and what you're doing and how you are doing it. And let them be the ones that are getting agitated and angry and all that sort of thing. And you, you know, I found it a lot easier, if that's the right word, mm. to get through it in that way. Um, having seen game experiences of other players that perhaps wasn't. And I remember a conversation I had with um, no, a friend of mine who knew Laurie Cunningham. And Laurie Cunningham had dodge abuse from somebody in the street. And Laurie, if anybody knew him, he could take care of himself. I mean, he had very quick feet, but trust me, his hands were even quicker if needed to be. So he just said to them, look, if you feel that way, I'm telling you, come and have a cup of coffee with me in that cafe over there, and you can tell me exactly why you feel the way you do. And this person agreed. And went and they sat there, had a cup of coffee, and they, oh, can you tell him? And then Laurie told him his point of view and whatever. And by the end of it, it wasn't even a case of them um, agreeing to disagree. The other guy thought, yeah, no, he's no different to me. Apart from his skin colour, he is no different to who I am. I think that is the thing that I always try to portray and get across to people that were abusing me. Some of my skin is the only difference we have. Mm. You know, when I've been to schools, I've spoken to kids and I've got one of the little kids up with me, you know, and they are white away, and I say, look, what is the difference between us when, we, when you're here? And they go, yeah, you're, yeah, yeah, I'm taller, I'm this and whatever. But, you know, there's no difference apart from our skin colour. So if some alien came here now and took our skin off, they wouldn't know if I, that I was black or whatever, because we're exactly the same underneath. And um, so the important thing was always, how do you deal with it? Mm. For me, there were so many other things going on, but I think you've got to cut to a way that you yourself can get through it, which can help and hopefully point the way for others to. For me, it was a case of be the best person you could be when you're doing the job that you're doing and show people that you didn't have to resort to what they did, the name calling and all the abuse to get through it. You know, you held your head high and all the things that your parents taught you, especially anybody knows Caribbean parents, they know what Caribbean parents are like, very strict and very much on you for the way you need to behave. So that, that you know, that's, that, that's, what I, that's what I brought into it. And I had my, my mother and father and, and uncles and whatever to, and grandmother especially, because she took no prisoners by the way. So, you know, that's, that, that I thought was a very good grounding for me to then go on and do what I did. And it was, in a way, easier to handle it in that way. Mm. Because you didn't make other issues along the way. And let me ask you, sorry, I, I mean, in some of the conversations that we, we've had, I, I, I get the impression when people talk about the abuse they get, how they confront, how they confront it, how how they deal with it. It, it at times feels like a very lonely place, okay. like it's you against your world. Even even when when you do have a support network around you, is that something you found? How how was how was the dressing rooms that, that you shared? How were they supportive or not so much during your own challenges with, with racism? In the early days, it really was, you know, take no notice if you get on and play football. Because let's be frank, they didn't really understand which racist thing is because at the time, things that were said to people, but then it was just banter and people giving you a stick. It was just banter, mm. what, what it was. And even when you went to TV program, you think of some of the TV programs that were on at the time, Love Thy Neighbour. Mm -hmm. like you know, all those things were on prime time TV where racist attitudes were very blatant and very obvious. So you, it, it, how do you deal with it? You point the screaming and shouting at everybody else because well, that, yeah, if you're banging on a door to let you in, people will go and they ignore you because eventually they'll get tired and stop banging on the door. But if you're not quite the end of the eventually they'll go, look, okay, then let him in, let's see what he wants. 
character. Mm. And again, it's that attitude and you have to, yes, you're alone. At that moment when the abuse is going on, you are alone, there's no doubt about that. But the fact that you know that you have people around you, whether it be close family or friends or even your teammates that can sort of sympathize with what you're going through, that's all it needs because that's where then you are not alone. You can look around and maybe in the distance they're there, but they are there. Um, but on the pitch at the time, you have to you have to deal with it. And one of the ways that I dealt with it on the pitch, another way was I remember I was up um, up north somewhere, as you always are when you're playing the fourth division. You are, <laughs> um, and uh, I wasn't in the team, and I was on the bench. And I remember the manager said to me, Graham Taylor said to me, "Go and warm up because we're going to put you on." And I remember running down as sort of made a few runs, and I stopped in front of the stand. A lot of there's a horses are in on the side, and I was doing some stretches, and there was all sorts coming from behind me. Yeah. So again, me being who I am, I thought, what do you do? Do I run and go and do the warm-up up there? I'm not running from this. So I turned around rather than look at the pitch and I looked up at the stand and I was there doing my stretches and they were shouting and they said, oh, you cat. I was there and go, and I went, all sorts of names coming down at me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I just, so I just said to them, I said, hey, don't forget, You've paid good money to watch this black so and so play football. So who's the who's the idiot? Mm. You know? And mm. to be quite honest, it's mates around him as they do go, oh, I love you. realize then that it is the correct thing to do is to not be confronting about people, about it, but say to them, thank you what you're saying, but have you thought about it from this point of view? And that was pretty much how I how I looked at it from there on. Mm. And then Luther as well, um, you, of course, have been playing in England. We know that you played in Italy, um, where a lot of people have had some really bad experiences um, in terms of still. Yeah. I was just about to say, like, look at just as early as last year, we see the likes of, you know, Romelu Lukaku having to combat headlines, you know, like when they put up the match between Inter and Roma and call it Black Friday because it was him and, you know, Chris Smalling. But they're saying that, you know, whether it's a, a loss in translation, a language barrier, we call it what it is. It is what it is. Whether, no matter how you translate it, it does not read well. Um, what was your experience like playing in Italy, which so many players as well have told us it is a whole other daunting kettle of fish that they even feel more muzzled or less likely to try and combat it than, say, here in England? Yeah, no, in Italy, it was, it's almost accepted. because I think if you look at Italy in that, when it comes to games, yes, they don't want but the way they deal with the hooligans and stuff, they have their riot police, you know, that they have, and they steam them when they need to and hit a few heads and, you know, they go back and get on what they're getting on with. But the, but the supporters really have the right, as it seems, when you're there, to say and pretty much do as they like because it's their team and they can support it in, in whichever way they choose, um, you know, they see fit to do so. So it makes it difficult when it becomes something about someone's colour or their nationality because they're very patriotic in Italy. You can tell by the way they, they but, but I look at it and I've said to one of the people, I said, so why is it that you can be proud of who you are because you're Italian, but yet I can't be from where I come from? And again, it's getting people to think about what they're doing because people quite often just react and say things that they do and behave in a way. So you just gotta sometimes make them stop and think it may not change them, but it may just let them think before they do it again, hmm, why am I doing this and should I be doing it? And sometimes that's as much as you can do, but Italy has always been and still is. And they have made, they've made improvements like, they, like we have here. And I think we should not forget the conversation goes on and what I've heard from one or two current and younger footballers is that they believe they have it much tougher now than myself and other players did back then. And that's nonsense. That is mm -hmm. absolute nonsense. They really need to have a reality check of what life was like. You're getting off a coach, a 17, 18 year old. And as you walk off the coach, first thing you hear when they come there, look, they've got a, mm -hmm. come on. And then that's that quarter to two. And from quarter to two, until you get back on the bus at six o'clock, that is the abuse that you get. And the numbers just grow as the game and the game goes on. And that's every, every game you play up and down the country. So, yes, social media doesn't help, but you have to look at 
because the players help themselves. And I'm not talking about only players of colour or whatever, because the players actually help themselves by flaunting their wealth and what they can do and how they live their life outside of football to people that sometimes their ticket has cost them their entire week's wages to go and watch their team play. Mm. You know, so there's always the other side to things where the responsibility is as much on the player as much as it is on the perpetrator sometimes because they're reacting sometimes to what they see to be something unjust or you're not pulling your weight or whatever. And people react in different ways and you just have to be mindful of that. I'm not saying it's right. I mean, sometimes you just have to be mindful of what you're doing and what you're contributing to the things when that come back. I, I want to uh, prove on, on that just a little bit further, Luther. You, you say that players today see, or some players today seem to think that the, the abuse that they face is worse than than yeah. you did um, b- back in your day. What, what do you make of the moment that we're in with the game, ar- around social media, as you mentioned, uh, around um, the players taking the knee before games start? How, how do you how do you think that impacts change that the game has been calling for for generations? I think the, the taking the knee on that very first game when they came back from um, on restart when they all the players did that I thought it was a really powerful message that the players were sending out because the way I looked at that particular moment was the players were saying a little while ago a black man died because somebody kneeled on his neck and he's mm. there. And so we're saying, remember Floyd, every time, you know, when we kneel down, you remember that. But has that message in time been lost? Because are they, are they now doing it because of racism? Are they doing it because of the change they want? Or... See, that's my thing. I think it's been lost in it because the players really haven't come out and explained and said, this is what we want to do. This. We stand for change. What does that mean? We stand for change. We all, we've been trying to change things since, especially mm-hmm. uh, get out and try to raise them all started. We've been fighting for that and we've made enormous strides since then. You think what it was like, even for yourself. I mean, when I heard the story about the, you putting petrol in the car and the stick you were getting and they realised mm-hmm. suddenly Oh, you know, you're one of ours, as you said earlier, that it's okay. So I think players need to be clearer for me on what they stand for and why they are kneeling. I personally would not have knelt again after that first, first time. Mm. But that was the one. This is why we're doing it. And then if you want to join us, let's all stand together against racism, injustice, and all of that. Supporters can join in that. See, the supporters can join in that. The supporters can't join in when the players are kneeling. So start, you know, mm-hmm. quiet. But if you say we stand together, players link arms together like they do when somebody has passed away and they show togetherness. And I think that is a that would be a far better thing for the players to demonstrate, to, to demonstrate that feeling for me. How, how, can, how can those players advocate for that change effectively? Because ordinarily, you know, as... as as players, it's not something that kind of unified call for change is not something we've ever done. In, no. in, in all honesty, is is it through through the PFA? Is it through uh, what, what mechanisms are available to today's players to make I, that call? I think the players, you know, they say we stand for this, but if they want to really affect change. Everybody, all these players should look at the club they play for. Okay. Because in the clubs they play for, on the playing side, they've probably got three, four, five, six, seven, eight players of colour. That's part of that squad. Take away the playing side from that. When you go to the actual structure and management structure of the club itself, that's where the change has got to start. Because once you start to get that change, that, that, that change there, I think that quickly, because we you know, Things drip down the chain. Mm-hmm. Very rarely goes up. It drips down. So mm-hmm. need to at clubs, they need to start saying how many people of colour or whatever do we have working at the club? Not in an apron, 
not in an ivory jacket, yeah, not serving and stuff like that, and showing, but actually, who's your marketing director or manager, chief executive, chairman, you know, and all various other jobs there are in a football club because it because everybody says football is a business, and yes, you have to run it that way. So in all those areas, counts and whatever. Do they have representation in that? And it's the same for the FA. If that, if, if that representation is there, then I think we can say we have truly made some real strides. And that's where the players can do that because at the clubs they're at, they've got value. They can say, what are we at this club doing for it? And they ask that question. Mm -hmm. That for me is far stronger than what the players are doing now because what happens after a period of time? People go, all right, just wait for it. Even the players themselves, you watch it now. The players then are almost getting up before the 10 seconds because they want to get on with the game. I've seen games mm -hmm. where they kicked off as the whistle has gone for them to kneel and, and take it. So it's run its course. And they need to know mm -hmm. something that is more relevant so supporters and everybody can feel a part of it and we'll go with that together. But then again, as everything goes, then you have to have a change because... What happens? The people that don't want the change are very happy to see players taking the knee, and that they think can be great. While they're doing that, we can still get on with what we're doing because nobody's looking for me, and they can almost use and hide behind that and say, "Yeah, we stand for change as well." But deep down, yeah. we're not going to make that change because we like it the way it is. Luther, I want to thank you so very much for joining us on this edition of the conversation. I mean, Shaka was excited last time when he when you confirmed, he said, we're going to take it old school. And I loved actually <laughs> just hearing your stories. I mean, just hearing what it was like back then. And we definitely just want to thank you overall as persons of color for fighting that good fight from way back when. And, you know, hopefully um, my generation, at least, and the generations can the, to come can continue that fight that you started. And um make you proud really and truly because as you said we all have to just be in this together so thank you so much for your time thank you very much and that's absolutely right we can do it together and it's the only way uh, i will i will echo alexis's sentiments here luther um i i feel as 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 um changing a moment as, as we find ourselves in we can't lose lose sight of of the history that that has brought us to this point where Players like Raheem Sterling and Marcus Rashford uh, can have the platform that they do to 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 call for that societal change that that, that you've seen them do over 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 recent months. Um, on a personal level, I, I I feel it's it's thanks to players like yourself who've had to endure so much that afforded me the opportunity to to be a professional footballer, to be a black man, and and recognize. Some of my own boyhood dreams. I, I will, I, I will never discount or discredit the role that you and so many like you have played. Thank you very much for again sharing your stories with us. It's it's so powerful, so impactful. No, oh, thank you very much, and I think that it's amazing to hear you actually say that because that I think younger players need to appreciate, and if they really appreciate that. And again, adding on to things, do we as a black race know our own history enough mm -hmm. so that we can know where we've come from but you need to know that to have any idea of where you're going and how you're going to get there and i think we need to be a little bit more and the, the wins what you've done with your career and now after your career you know is just quite incredible and people should do that i, I said it to the camera the other day i said to him you know people say yeah but i said but look what you've done since you stopped playing and the profile now that you have because of what you mm. continue to do. And I said, no, thank you for what you're doing because as long as you're out there, people, you know, kids can say, I can be the next person that does what can be done. And that's important that we acknowledge all of those wins, all those positive all the time. And for me, we don't do it nowhere near enough. We, stop, we need to stop this victim mentality and start mm -hmm. looking at all the winners and the people that have been successful. Amen to that. As Joel Osteen says, be a victor, not the victim. You know it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what mommy preached to me every day. <laughs>
Well, thank you very much for watching ESPN on YouTube. For more sports highlights and analysis, be sure to download the ESPN app. And for live streaming, premium content, and let's not forget as well, ESPN FC, seven days a week. Subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.